Good evening. Welcome to the Bali. Welcome to the program, A Case for More Migration. A Case for More Migration. I mean, it almost sounds a little bit like science fiction, I thought, in these times where borders are like iron gates. Well, not for everyone, but for most of the population. And where xenophobic hate speech is so widespread. Welcome. <laughs> So, I don't know, I'm very hopeful about the talk we're going to have tonight. I'm also a little bit skeptical about the talk we're going to have tonight, but I'm mostly very interested in the talk we will have tonight. My name is Meert Freese. I will be your moderator this evening. This program was directed by program editor Sarah Toxos, and it was made possible by the generously funds of the VFONS. Um, yes. So, um, we're very happy to have you in our midst, acclaimed writer Suketu Mehta. Uh, he is teaching currently as an assistant professor at New York University, and in between he is traveling around the world to discuss his thought-provoking book, This Land is Our Land, an Immigrant's Manifesto. And one of the main arguments in the book is that the West is being destroyed, not by immigrants, but by the fear of them. And that is why Suketu argues that we need a new story, we need a new narrative around migration. And what we will be discussing tonight is, well, the inevitability of mass migration, uh, the fact that uh, Suketu argues that he sees migration also as a sort of restoration, um, the fact that he argues that migration is also a really a global possibility for uh, economic opportunity, but mostly tonight we're going to focus on discourse and uh, the role of discourse with regard to migration. So, is it possible to create a narrative that is as successful as the current xenophobic anti-migration story? A narrative that counters the fear of loss, the fear of the other. Um, a narrative that presents migration just as a fact of life and maybe even as a, you know, a possibility with a positive outcome. Um, and who should create this narrative, politicians or writers? So, um, Suketu will be joined by Dutch writer Abdelkader Benali. They have known each other for more than 15 years, um, met each other last night, wrote each other a letter on the subject, and they will read it out, and then we'll discuss the things further. We're also going to do later on a migration quiz, led by Eshan Fajania and in which we'll examine, we will examine our own bias when it comes to the discourse on migration. And then some practical notes. Um, so this program is also live streamed, so welcome to all the viewers uh, at home. But also at the end of the program there will be room for questions. Please wait uh, for the microphone because otherwise the people at home do not hear your question. And after the program, there will also be a book sale of Suketu's books. And he's happy to sign them, and he's also happy to have drinks with you, who already told me. So please, uh, please do. Um, okay, so without further ado, Suketu Meta, please join me. Big hand of applause. <laughs> so, an, uh, a professor in journalism in New York, but you're... Uh, Besides from this book, most known for the book Maximum City, Bombay Lost and Found. Uh, it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, it won numerous other prizes, but now we have this book. And I think um, you have been asked this question maybe a million times, but I think it is important to start this conversation. Why did you want to write this book? Well, not right now, did you write it? Two years ago, I think? The answer is rage. Out of rage. Rage. Yeah. I uh, started writing this book in 2016, yeah. uh, the year that uh, a comet hit the United States in the name of Donald Trump, uh, who's an existential threat to the planet. But I started writing it um, because the whole discourse around migration worldwide is told from the viewpoint of the rich countries. Should we let in immigrants? How many should we let in? Should they be skilled or unskilled? <coughs> and I started asking myself, why is it that these people are moving? Mm -hmm. Is it because they hate their homes and their families and their language and their foods? What makes them move? So then I begin the book with 
a story that my grandfather once mm. told me. So my grandfather was born in India when it was ruled by the British and then moved to colonial Kenya and then retired in London. Mm. Um, and one day in the late 1990s, he was sitting in a park commanding his own business. And this elderly British gent comes up to my grandfather and wags a finger in his face and says, why are you here? Why don't you go back to your country? And my grandfather, who was a businessman, said, because we are the creditors. You came to my country, you stole all my gold and my diamonds, so we have come to collect. We are here because you were there. Yeah. So it fit me thinking that, you know, the reasons people move, particularly from the global south to global north, in my book, I identify these four factors, which are colonialism, mm -hmm. what replaced colonialism, which is corporate colonialism, war, and climate change. Yeah. Uh, and I'll elaborate on them later, but just when you take the, what my grandfather was talking about, in my book, I take stories and then um, I give the reader numbers to back up the stories. Um, when, the, when the United Kingdom, uh, Great Britain, when it invaded India and colonized India at the beginning of the 18th century, the Indian share of the world's economy was 23%, so roughly a quarter of world GDP came from India. By the time the British left in 1947, India's share of world GDP was under 4%. Hmm. Where did that money go? When I walk around London and I see these beautiful palaces and museums, I think I should have a room there. Claire, is this also that you say like migration is a form of reparation? Yes, very much so. Um, to take um, you know, one of the other factors that I uh, mentioned, uh, mm. the role of war in causing migration. Why are all these Syrians and Iraqis on the move? It's not because they want to see the lights of the Eiffel Tower or uh, catch a show in Times Square. It's because the US and NATO, uh, many of the European countries, launched an illegal and unnecessary war mm. in Iraq and blighted the country and the region. Over a million Iraqis lost their lives. And I submit that a million living Iraqis now should be allowed to enter the United States and European countries as reparations. Yeah, because you say, I'm gonna quote, because it's like immigration quotas should be based on how much the host country has ruined other countries. So I thought, okay, um, how do you measure ruined? And like, I was thinking of countries like Hungary or like Australia, whose head hasn't ruined another country, but it has ruined the country itself. Are they obliged to take people or are they free of it? Like, how do you see this? So, uh, you know, I was faced with the same question in Norway while I okay. was just uh, two days ago. There was this Norwegian saying, hey, you know, we are a nice. Yeah, they we never, never did anything. We never colonized anyone. We just, <laughs> our greatest crime is lutefisk. Um, we've never really, you know, done. How are we? Um, complicit in this. So the greatest driver in migration in this century, in the 21st century, is going to be climate change. Yeah. According to UN estimates, over a billion people are going to be displaced by climate change um, by 2050. If you think four million Syrians on the move um, is uh, a threat, what happens when Bangladesh gets flooded and 400 million Bangladeshis have to find dry land? Well, who's responsible for this? The United States put in one third of the excess carbon in the atmosphere. European countries, another quarter. Mm -hmm. Norway is the world's seventh largest petroleum exporter. Last year, um, Norwegian petroleum revenues um, amounted to $20 billion. And when Greenpeace sued the Norwegian government, demanding that it, um, it comply with its own uh, climate policies, the Norwegian government in court said, well, we're not responsible because we just drill for the oil and it's burnt somewhere else, so it's not our problem. Yeah. So, you know, uh, all these countries, Australia, um, there's actually an Indian man from my home state of Gujarat named Gautam Adani, yeah. who is um, uh, opening the world's largest coal mine. It's called the Carmichael Coal Mine. I uh, write about that in my book. Um, 
Australia has just had these horrific wildfires, but they're going ahead with this coal mine because they can sell this coal. It's not going to be burnt in Australia. It's going to be burnt in India. He's going to take this coal, take it to India, burn the coal in India, and then sell it to neighboring countries like Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So it'll effectively ruin three countries. Yeah. So you say like um, ru ruining another country can be in many ways, and um, every Western country has its share in it. Well, Western countries have more of a share in it. I mean, yeah. you know, the f I've got plenty of figures <laughs> in my. Uh, <laughs> you can do two. <laughs> the amount of silver shipped between 1503 and the early 1800s amount to a debt of $165 trillion that Europe owes Latin America today. If you were to calculate, for example, whatever debts the Netherlands owes mm -hmm. Indonesia, I mean, it'd be incalculable. Um, it's, it's not... But then maybe my... my will, when you, th when you think in this way, uh, will the West ever redeem itself? Well, so my book is an angry book, but with a happy ending. <laughs> And the happy ending is when people move, everyone benefits. The migrants themselves benefit. In uh, many cases, it's literally a difference of life and death. Um, and the receiving countries benefit, mm. particularly uh, the rich countries, because they're not making enough babies. Mm. Um, Europe, I mean, it's, the, the figures are indisputable. The EU population will shrink by 13% by the end of this century. Um, the replacement fertility rate, the number of babies each woman needs to have mm. in order for a country's population to stay the same, is 2.1 babies per woman. Uh, the Dutch fertility rate is 1.6. Mm. So as a result, last year marked the first year where half of all Dutch adults mm. are over 50. Yeah. Mm. In 1950, fewer than one in three Dutch adults were over 50. Today, there are three working Dutch people for every Dutch person over the age of 65. By 2013, just 10 years, it's going to be two Dutch workers for every person over the age of 65. So all these countries are getting older, people yeah. are living longer, and they need um, new workers to pay into the old age uh, systems and the healthcare systems of their but uh, when, retirees. But when I and hear the number happening. of 13%, okay, but then you just also said the number of you know, what if, Bang I mean, it's not even imaginable, but what if Bangladesh, uh, uh, how do you say that, flashes? No, um, f flashes, Lugs. flashes, floods. Lugs. I mean, that these numbers are not even, you know, imaginable. Are you then still in a way optimistic that, I mean, of course they have to migrate because they have to save themselves, but is it also still an optimistic idea that this will, you know, lead to a better, you know, life? for everyone in the end? So it depends how it's managed. I mean, okay. one possibility is that uh, Western governments start shooting at men and women as they try to come across the borders, which is already happening. Yeah. The, um, the US government, the Border Patrol, was tear gassing women and children um, in, at the San Diego-Tijuana border, which um, I write about in my book yeah. um, uh, just last year. Uh, the other possibility is that there's actually enough space on this beautiful planet that we share for everyone. Now, you know, the, the argument is made that these people in Africa, in Asia, you know, we need population control because what will happen if all of them have Western lifestyles? Well, yeah, we do need population control of Westerners, the people who are actually using more resources than uh, everyone else on the planet. The average American uses as much in resources as 35 Indians or 189 Ethiopians. So if you want to have population control, it's better to have controls on the American population than the Indian or Ethiopian population, if climate change, if mm. saving the climate is your objective. People have always moved. It's a fact of uh, human history. This whole regime of borders and passports is only about 100 years old. We shouldn't take it as a given. Mm. Look, there, there's also this fear, what happened if a whole bunch of people move from one place to another in a short amount of time. How will we assimilate them all? During the age of mass migration in the 19th century, fully one quarter of Europe got up and moved to America. Yeah. And what happened? The United States replaced Europe at the pinnacle of world wealth and power. 
it became a, a thriving nation. Mm -hmm. Canada right now wants to increase its immigration intake threefold because they need warm bodies for a cold country. Warm bodies for a cold country, wow. Is that our slogan? Um, <laughs> Uh, well, the, whole, uh, <laughs> the, the Netherlands, uh, uh, as I found out today, is a wet country. I don't know about cold country, but you know, maybe good swimmers. <laughs> yeah. Um, my last question for this is, we talk about historical uh, causes, uh, economic opportunities, op economic causes, uh, but not about cultural effects, you know, and one of the biggest thing is that with... Uh, immigration immediately this there's this fear you know of loss of culture yeah. and identity yeah. um, well first of all do you think this is this fear is true and my second question is is it may, maybe also something the West just you know has to accept that maybe its culture will be you know lost yeah I hear this you know this argument well you know the West will lose its culture and if people want to c come here, they should do so legally. Ask yourself this, has the West ever gone anywhere legally? Did it ever ask any of the, uh, the territories it went in whether their culture would mm -hmm. be threatened? No. Um, did those colonial officials um, apply legally to go mm -hmm. to Indonesia and India? Um, look, the, the whole language around migrants, whether it's in the United States or in the Netherlands or in India, is of rapists terrorists, termites, you know, a threat. They're coming for our women. They're actually ordinary heroes. And, you know, I found this out when I went to the, um, the border between San Diego and Tijuana. And that's where I found out, really, if, if anyone has any doubts about what these people are here for, they should go to this place. It's called Friendship Park. Yeah. Now, along the entire southern border, there's only one place where if you don't have papers, you can meet your family uh, and you can meet them face to face. And so this began in the Nixon administration. There used to be a patch of ground right by the Pacific Ocean where your family could come from the other side, you could give them a hug, have a picnic, then they would go back to Mexico, you'd go back to the US. So over successive years, this, uh, patch of ground became more and more sort of fenced in. And mm. right now, under the Trump administration, there's a thick, ugly industrial mesh fence. But I spent two weeks doing some of the most heartbreaking reporting of my career. So I stood there with a notebook as I saw, for example, a Mexican man who hadn't seen his mother for 17 years. And this man had left Mexico because his mother was ill. And he worked in the US, he was in Colorado, doing any work he could, so he could send back uh, money to his mother for her medical treatment. Every week, um, whatever he saved, he sent back. And he would Skype with his mother, but he wanted to see her. So finally, he made this very difficult journey on bus, because you can't go on planes, and she'd come up from a remote region in Mexico. And I saw them, I saw him move towards this fence, and saw his mother, for the first time in 17 years, come up to meet her son. And he puts up his face and his hands to the fence, and she comes up. And he told me later he could hear, he, he could feel her breath on his face. And he said to her, Mom, I miss you. She said, I love you, son. And then he said, you look thin, you're not eating enough. The eternal <laughs> question asked of all mothers to their <laughs> children. And he so badly wanted to give her a hug, but all he could do was, he put up his hand, and the hole in the fence is only big enough to put your pinky finger through. So he puts his pinky finger through, mom puts her pinky finger through, and they do this thing called the kissing of the pinkies, <laughs> all along the fence, mothers and children, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, doing this pinky kiss, this desperate attempt to make the slightest human connection. And I looked at all these people, and most of them had crossed over, not because they wanted to invade or steal from these countries, but to work and send back money for their families, what you and I would do for our children. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're not terrorists and rapists. They're ordinary heroes, these migrants. And this is how we should see them. Clear. Thank you.
I think we're going to discuss this more even with Abdelkader. H how did you meet Abdelkader 15 years ago? Where was this? In a dark alley somewhere, <laughs> Abdel. Um, I was on a book tour with my last book, um, uh, Maximum City, Bombay Lost and Found. And um, how did we meet? Did Akhil introduce us? Uh, yeah, okay. he'll, he'll, he'll oh, let me hear. know. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you wrote him a letter? On the yes, subject, right? I did. Of I did indeed. We're, uh, we're going to listen to it. Yeah. Please uh, take the stage. Okay. Or, it, you know what, I'll just sit down here. It's okay. just easier <laughs> when I was on stage. Um, since it's here. So, I wrote this letter last week. Dear Abdel, I'm really excited about our conversation next Monday at the Bali, old friend. It is rare that I get to talk about migration, which is as natural as the weather or the movement of birds, with another writer, and one who has thought about the same conundrums. Here's some kindling for the fire to get our chat started. I remember you telling me in Tangier, uh, a year nice. before last, about the Kissa, which is a cassette tape that Moroccan immigrants to Europe would send back to the family in which the migrant would record his kissa, his tale of the new land. The whole family would gather to listen to side A, which would be about work, the weather, money, politics. Then there would be a general throat clearing, <clears throat> and the room would clear out, and only the wife would be left. She would turn over the tape and listen to side B, which would be filled with declarations of love and longing and a little bit of lust. I put this charming story in my book. We tell stories, do we not? To collect ourselves after this giant dislocation. How did your family tell stories? What kind were they? How did storytelling save you? You also told me once about how your whole family grew up watching Bollywood movies in Holland. When I asked why, you explained, we like that, in the end, everyone bows down and touches the mother's feet. It is very difficult for Westerners to understand the concept of family for us pre-cynical peoples. Family with all its exaltations, hindrances, and indispensability. When we come knocking on the doors of our colonizers, we bring our families with us. Open up, we say. You came to our homes and you did not ask permission. Now you have left us bereft and we have no choice but to come to yours. We bring you inestimable gifts, our little ones, who will grow up and make your country, our country, strong. When Indonesian migrants from the Netherlands' former colony began arriving in Holland in the 1950s, Dutch government officials regularly made unannounced inspections of their homes to make sure they were eating potatoes and not rice and were thus assimilating into Dutch culture. Now young Dutch people go out and delight in Rijksstafel, I think your father was a butcher, if memory serves me right. What's the role of food in keeping the migrant's identity? How is he defined by what he eats and what he does not? In 2006, the Dutch government tried to make itself unattractive to potential Muslim and African migrants by creating a film called To the Netherlands, which included scenes of gay couples kissing and topless women sunbathing. The film was a study aid for a $433 compulsory entrance exam for people immigrating for family reunification, except for people making more than $54,000 a year or citizens of rich countries like the United States for whom the requirement was waived. The film also showed the rundown neighborhoods where immigrants might end up living. There were interviews with immigrants who called the Dutch cold and distant. The film warned of traffic jams, problems finding a job, and flooding in the low-lying country. Here was an example of negative storytelling, a story that a government tells about its own country that paints it in a bad light to keep out the other. Our mutual friend Mohsin Hamid, the Pakistani writer, when I told him the story, he said, the Dutch government should just instead create another film called Wonderful, Wonderful Belgium. <laughs> Almost the Netherlands, but closer. <laughs> All over the world, we are engaged in this epic battle of storytelling. A populist like Trump, like Modi, like Orban is basically a gifted storyteller, one who can tell a false story well. 
And the only way he can be defeated is by telling a true story better. How do we separate true story from false stories? How do we give the truth wings? I welcome your thoughts. Thank you. So, um, well, Abdul Qadir Ben Ali, I don't, I don't think you need a lot of introduction. Um, you write on a lot of issues, but you also write a lot on the issue of migration and how the immigrant never really feels at home. And you uh, wrote a letter back. Where are you going to read it? There? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, this is okay too. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, all. Um, I had the pleasure of having you at our home yesterday evening, where you shared uh, a dinner with, with us, my wife, uh, my daughter of four and a half, and, and our newborn daughter, uh, Hannah. And um, it, was, it was delightful. And, and we, we have known each other now for 15 years, a bit more. And I, I, the first time we met was in Brooklyn. At the time, you were working on a very personal biography of Mumbai. And I visited you together with a, another writer from uh, uh, India, uh, Akhil Sharma, whom I had met in Rotterdam as a writer in residence. We became friends, and I visited him in New York, and he invited me to come and see you in Brooklyn. And I remember a tiny working room, a very small working room, that couldn't accommodate more than three persons standing. And there was, there was it, and you were there, and you had a pile of, of, of um, paper, which was going to become that big book on Mumbai. And when, I remember we had a pizza in a nearby pizzeria, and the, the pizza was huge. And uh, the pizza was so huge, it would have been impossible for us to eat those pizzas in your working apartment. <laughs> so the fact that I remember this says something about how our memory works. And it says something about the immigrant. Because we are used to continuous transition, never standing still, always meeting new people, new countries, new places. And apparently, I, as a son of a butcher and a gourmet, I remember spaces and food the best. I remember what I ate. I remember the room I was in, the house I entered, and I was welcomed. You give vivid examples of these experiences in your book. When we migrate, we change spaces. And our bodies become part of an experiment that belongs to the field of physics. Because the migrant proves that it is possible to occupy two spaces at the same moment with one single body. The reason we do this is out of a necessity try to try to cope with the trauma of transition. Going from one culture to another, Leaving family behind is a rupture that's never overcome wholly. People remember the day they arrive vividly. You also do this in your book. They can remember the weather, the, the cold, the heat, the snowflakes, the rain, the fog, the smog, the stars, the moon, the chill on the spine, the soft breeze of the harsh wind. The body remembers more than the mind. Arriving is a cold shower. Many migrants come from the hot regions of the world and go to the more colder regions. In a way, they defy what is normal in climate. Cold goes to warm. But we immigrants, we go from warm to cold. Indeed, we are a strange breed. I remember then talking about, with you about the global appeal of the Bollywood movies. We devoured them at home in the Berkos Lounge and 2B, 3038 and in Rotterdam. Because the climax of the movie was the moment that the wandering son saw his mother again. After one, two hours of, of, of spectacular festivities and adventures. And what does the son? He, he does something very simple. He threw himself at the feet of his mother. And we all cried. Even, even my, my father, who never cries. Why do we cry? Well, it's easy to see, the, to see the symbolism of it. The migrant son throws himself at the feet of his mother country. Feet are the first part of the body that leaves the soil. But they're also the first part 
that touches the soil. So the feet of the mother are the most precious part of humanity because they connect everything with everything. They connect our earth with our heart, with our ancestors, and with our longing for redemption. One kiss is enough. I remember fondly those cassettes you talked about. They, I mean, stories find their way into books that were sent to the family in the rural area. In the cassettes, the father, my father, the Gastarbeiter, the Gastarbeiter, would talk about the difficult, difficult circumstances. He would talk about the weather. And yes, he would spare some room to address his wife, this, this B-side. You know, normally, you know, the A-side is like the, the good music and the B-side, you know, the leftover. But with those cassettes, it was the opposite. And what happened next was that the family would use... It. So, so what happens when they listen to that cassette, A and B, they would use that cassette to deliver their own message. Because those cassettes were very expensive. So they, they would use through a, tr a simple trick, they would use the cassette to record their message to the sun. And the symbolism of this is very clear for us. The message of the migrant sun was erased to deliver the message of the family, which, which says something about how conscious migrants are of the nullity of their identity. And the migrant son feared those cassettes from the village because those cassettes were an endless plea for more money to come their way. The migrant son is always in debt to his family. It should make him proud, but it leaves him depressed. I never met a first migration migrant that smiled. To talk about food is, about, is, uh, is talking about repairing the trauma. Our food is sacred. It's not part of the new country. By eating the food of the mother country, we are staying alive. Moroccans are obsessed about their food. It's not, a, it's not about the recipe or the preparation, it's about the quality of the food. And it goes deeper. It's not about how it tastes, but it's about how it makes you whole, how it nurtures the soul. The, 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 the food of our ancestral origin has, has a kind of homeopathic power. It can heal you from a headache or nausea or depression. You know, eat this, you will feel good. So by migrating food to our mouth, we exercise the pain that comes with loss. I will conclude, uh, Suke, to, uh, to ask you something. A, a question that's puzzling me now since a year or two, which has to do with, with the discourse around migration. Your book is full of anger. Anger at the treatment of migrants. The racism, the populism, and the right-wing rhetoric. And it's getting only stronger. 15 years ago, this anger was already in en vogue. It was in, not en vogue, it was in us. We felt this anger. We, but we were told to be humble, to be grateful. And then one day, we just stopped being grateful. And now we talk in a different tone, your tone. And I'm surprised by the reception of your angry book. People sympathize with your anger. They seem to understand it. They seem to appreciate it. They want you not to be grateful anymore. So please tell me, Suketu, what happened that our anger has become accepted? Or am I dreaming? Thank you. Um, yeah, we could talk about food. Um, but I think we'll do that. The importance of food, but it's not a program. But it comes very vividly back in both of your letters. Um, I was thinking that this is my last thing on the comment on the food, is that even the most virulent xenophobic still likes to eat ethnic food often, <laughs> you know? So, I don't know, maybe food should be the, the discourse of food to kind of repair the image of the immigrant. But um, before, we, we're really going to talk about discourse and stories, etc. But first, I want like to ask Abdel Kader, you have heard more the political story of Suketu, how he thinks about uh, more immigration. 
What was your first response? Do you completely agree? Are there things you disagree with or have questions about or see in a different light or? Well, for the, for the sake of argument, I completely <laughs> disagree. Um, because I, th I, think, I think we need, I think we, we should listen to what the migrants want. We can, I mean, we can tell them, we can figure out what they want and how they want it. But migrants, they, be, they behave in, in very strange ways. They will never go, they will never fit the scenarios that are written or thought about in these kind of places or books. So, and when I look at migrants nowadays, I mean, there's a new breed of migrants. They are not the migrants we were. You know, we came to, you, you know, you came to Queens, I came to Rotterdam, and leaving the mother country was just, you know, it was, it was erased, you know. You, you, could not, it, you could phone to someone in Morocco, and that, but then the grandfather had to come from the village. You know, he would have really have to make an appointment to come to the city, to be there at a certain shop that had a phone, and sit and wait so someone in Rotterdam, pick, you know, and then, and then at that time, fo a phone call to Morocco was 2 gulden 50 a minute. That's, you know, it's like, like 6 euro. You know, I'm, I'm juggling with, with, uh, with inflation, but I think it was a lot. It's a lot of money. I mean, even, I mean, and especially a lot from a migrant family. Mm -hmm. so, 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 and my mother, she was so, she was, very, I'm going to tell you something that's quite, traumatic for my mother. My mother was so low. I mean, we talk about the men, but the women who pay the price for migration, it's, 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 we, you, we cannot understand it. Taking this young woman away from her family, from her sisters, from her mother, from, from her culture that, that nurtures her. I mean, the men, they were like strong, adventurous. They could fail, but, but we would still see them as heroes. But the, the women, they, they were just, you know, they were, they were anonymous. But my mother would, 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 make phone calls, and it cost my father, you know, my, there would, a bill would come. Mm -hmm. And these phone calls that she made to her sister in Belgium, and they, they cost a lot of money, you know, because she was calling her sister because of longing to talk to someone in her own language, mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. So what my father, he put a lock on the phone to stop that. Yeah. You know, otherwise she would have, you know, she would have, you know, had become like dead poor. So these are uh, stories. So, but now, the, the, I mean, the immigrant that, that comes from places like Aleppo, or they are in, in continuous contact with the mother country, you know, through WhatsApp, through, 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 through FaceTime. They, I mean, and we in should... What, but, but in what way does this change the I issue think of migration? It, it changes a lot because it's, it's also about money. I mean, money is coming from the Middle East, from India, from no, no, uh, the Maghreb, into the Western countries, following the footsteps of these people. They come here, they invest. What I'm saying is, these people are much more entrepreneurs, uh, managers of their own lives than the, the migrants of our time. And, and, and I'm very much in, in, in the line of circular migration. Mm -hmm. Circular migration. You know, we have Leo Lukasen, who, who's the migration specialist in Holland, who made a plea for circular migration. I'm, the, those borders, they mean nothing, when, because ca money goes both ways. And, 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 and uh, as you say, I mean, money is being taken from Africa, from Asia, like by Western companies. They don't pay taxes. Mm. You know, they take the gold, the silver, and they don't pay taxes. But, but what is circular migration? Uh, circular means that, that, that someone in Ghana and Accra mm. can apply for a job in, in Amsterdam. He gets a, 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 a five-year a multiple entry visa. Mm -hmm. And and he, he can come and he can leave whenever he wants. Mm -hmm. That's what people want. People are not migrating anymore forever. People are migrating for a short period, longer period, make money and they go back. If you ask migrants what they want, mm -hmm. they want to go back to their country. But then what has changed? Because I, I you know you know the Dutch government eh? uh, yeah. thought like uh, when uh, when Moroccan immigrants will come, they will work, they will go back. They didn't. Well, I have news for you. Yeah. They, they they did go back. The generation of my father, this is myth about migrants <laughs> staying forever. It's, uh, we have the facts. When I ask my fa father, uh, father in, uh, uh, in law or my father about his friends in the 70s, mm -hmm. they will tell you most of them went, went back. back to Morocco. So I write about this in my book, mm -hmm. uh, the, f the Circular Migration. My term for it is interlocal. So my, I'm a resident of Greenwich Village in New York, where I live. And 
the Bandra locality of a neighborhood of Bombay where I spend a lot of time. If you were to ask me um, where I belong, it's these two places. Increasingly around the world, we're finding people who identify themselves not by a nation or even a city, but by two or more localities mm -hmm. that they travel between. Um, and it's not just for the rich, th those who have papers. I know a group of Mexicans, uh, the restaurant workers in a part of Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and they live in Sunset Park in Brooklyn and a village uh, in the Puebla region of Mexico. Those who have papers go back and forth between these two regions, and if you were to ask them where do you belong, they'll say Sunset Park and Tijuana. Um, increasingly, the world is comprised of these interlocals, and I think it's a hopeful sign. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my home uh, has many rooms. I've got uh, a room in New York, I've got one in uh, Bombay, the uh, there's one in Paris, in London. Not literally, I'm not that rich. But it's the, the homes of my friends and relatives in these okay. countries. Yeah, because um, I almost wanted to ask this one that you said, it. Is, it, is this not kind of, kind of this elitist view on immigration, no, no, it's, no, you know? No, this is a fact. I mean, uh, you, you talk about that, that, that the region, but when you look at the, 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 the frontier border of uh, the Mediterranean, which mm. is uh, Gibraltar, Almeria, Andalusia, and northern Morocco, we now talk about it as, you know, the, 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 we need a front, Frontex. We, have, mm. we know we, we're paying, you know, this, this Frontex, which is a headquarter in Poland, to defend the border, southern border of, of Europe. And, and, and which means, which actually means that we pay Morocco to keep, you know, to the shoot the rubber bullets on the immigrants. You know, we pay Morocco to put the barbed wire at their side, not at the European side, so to get away from human rights violations. And, that's what, and, and the Moroccans, you know, they do this because they get, they get paid for this. Um, but when I talk with people in Tangier about Andalusia, they would say there was a time that we could go to Andalusia to work. We, we had, we, we, you got a, you, you, they would give you a visa to go to Andalusia to work. The, the, when you, the fruits of Europe, you know, our watermelons, our grapes, our, our, uh, they are all uh, 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 being produced in this region around, uh, around Almeria, which is mm. the, it's, it's the biggest greenhouse area of the world. And the major, majority of people who work there are immigrants from Morocco. They, they, mm. they, they work in terrible circumstances, almost like kind of slavery, but they work there. Mm. How can you say then, oh no, we should regulate migration, we should, uh, you know, you're already having these people within your border. They're working there, they're part of... If, if you stop, if you really stop uh, having these people here, you, the, you will not get people working in those, in those uh, greenhouses. Mm -hmm. And so, so I, I, the, the problem is that, that, that we are creating a myth about Europe mm -hmm. as a continent that, that has no migration. Abdel, may this, I this is, no, no, uh, <laughs> this is a kind of lie we're telling each, itself on, a, on, a, on not, not only on an elitist yeah. level, but also on European level. We're yeah. telling each, we're making, we're telling ourselves, Europe, it's a continent, people leave the continent, mm -hmm. then we have, but no, we are not a migration continent. It's America, you know, it's Asia, but we are a continent of migration. Yeah. And I think this, we, and as long as we're not acknowledging this, this, this fact, then, then we will never sort out this conflict between the head and the heart. So when we go to discourse and narrative, this is maybe a narrative like that is still not here, Europe as a migration country. I was thinking because I'm sitting here with two writers who both have a migration background. One is angry. Are you angry about the... Yeah. You're I'm, also... I'm, so do you... I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, steam is coming out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I was thinking, do you almost feel it as an obligation to write, to write about these issues? Or do you feel there's also the freedom to, you know, um, are not occupied? I've written lots of things. I've written love stories. Mm -hmm. I've written the world's first Hasidic Jewish love story mm -hmm. set in the wholesale mm -hmm. diamond business. Mm -hmm. It was made into a movie, part of New York, I Love You, starring Natalie Portman and mm -hmm. Irfan Khan. Mm -hmm. I've written Bollywood movies. I write about art, I write lots of things, yeah. but this is the thing right now that I'm pissed about. Yeah. So, you know, when writers get pissed about something, they write. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'd like to answer your uh, question, Abdel, about this idea of being grateful mm. and um, this 
change in our position. You know, you're quite right that uh, earlier generations of immigrants, they came in, you know, they were expected to be good little immigrants, uh, pat us on the head, we'll wag wag our tails, um, thank you for letting us in. And there's been a change. Um, and, you know, part of the responses to my book is other immigrants around the world responding to this. And so I'll, in response, I'll read out that there's a short email that I got in the fall from uh, a doctor of Indian origin living in New Zealand. Uh, I got, Dear in, Mr. New Mehta, Zealand. in New Zealand. In New Zealand, yeah. yeah. Dear Mr. Mehta, my name is Nisha Nair. I'm 40 years old, and I work as a public health doctor in Wellington, New Zealand. I migrated here as a 16-year-old from Malaysia slash Brunei without my parents. I've been here ever since. I love it, and I hate it. I read your book, The Immigrants Manifesto, a week ago. I gulped it down in about 12 hours straight. I had no idea how hungry I was for the things you said in it until I read it. Moving here has been the most defining experience of my life, but I've never examined it too closely. I'm not sure why not. For 24 years, I think I swallowed the immigration rhetoric that floats around here. I bought it hook, line, and sinker. Until the day before your book, I honestly believed that I was what they said, an opportunist who had snuck into the country when the immigration laws were less rigid, that no amount of tax or contribution would ever equal the privilege of being allowed to stay here, that I was not entitled to bring over my aging parents, whom I miss and worry about in a way that words can't hold because they had never, quote, contributed to the country that I was to be congratulated for being the right kind of migrant because of my profession, my good English, my adaptability, my interest in rugby, my ability to read a room and adjust my behavior accordingly to be just the right small amount of exotic and the right large amount of kiwi. <laughs> I really needed your book. I have it on my phone, highlighted and annotated. Give us more nice things. <laughs> um, I feel as if someone has stood up for me after many years. My shoulders are a little straighter these days. After years of not belonging anywhere, I'm really proud to claim membership of this crappy, tenacious, optimistic little community <laughs> of global border crossers. I'll never look at my brown face the same way again. So, you know, this woman's a doctor, clearly she has a career as a writer if the medicine doesn't work out. <laughs> um, but she, you know, it, that email has some essential truth about how we migrants have perceived ourselves and a reclaiming of self-respect. We have contributed enormously to these countries. The Netherlands would fall apart without immigrants, so would the United States. And, you know, by being... Uh, mm -hmm. I, I wrote this op-ed in the Washington Post uh, saying, I'm an uppity immigrant, don't expect me to be grateful. There's this lovely American word, uppity, which was used to describe black slaves who rose above that station. You know, in, in the end, yes, we are grateful, but it's not to these institutions that have forced us to move. It's we're grateful to individual acts of kindnesses that mm -hmm. we find in the host country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, both, both of us, I'm sure, have experienced plenty of those. Mm -hmm. But in the end, this anger is called for because of the way that we're depicted. It's that kind of storytelling that has to be fought by our reclaiming our dignity. And how do you see this anger in larger structures? Eh? You, you give this email, but how do you see uh, this other, you know, this new type of response? Can you maybe... Oh, well, I, the, the problem mm. I have, I think there are so many different immigrants, mm. and so, you know, and so it's very hard to talk mm. about the immigrant the, the, because... The, the, the thing that surprises me at, at this period of time mm. We have always been angry, you know, immigrants, where they come together, they start this conspiracy, you know, talk about how shitty the country is they live in, and they, and they exchange experiences. And, and this, this, cha this, this exchange is healing, because you don't have, because the rest of the society is not, is, does not want to hear your story, just be good, be your best, be better, than, 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 and, and, and move along. I mean, that's how we survive. Mm -hmm. So you come together, and, 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 and I talked on, on different podia and fora about these issues for almost 25 years now. I mean, yeah. it's not that I woke up <laughs> last week thinking about, oh, wow, th there's an immigrant issue. <laughs> but what has changed, and I'm surprised by this, and I want to know from you, Suketu, or from, or from you, the audience, 
what surprises me that the audience has become receptive to our stories. Mm -hmm. That we are, that anger is being very strange, but is being accepted as legitimate. Because so, I remember, yeah. even like places like here, people would say, why are you so angry? Mm -hmm. You have no reason to be angry. Which was delegitimizing de my feelings. Uh, and then I, and I, as, uh, the people who said this, they said it in such a soft-spoken, nice way, it mm -hmm. felt almost therape therapeutic, you know, the, 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 um, the, 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 the insult. Yeah. But what has happened is that the audience itself is looking at the world and is not digging into the rhetoric anymore of populists. They are seeing that there's another truth behind it, behind the propaganda, behind the fear-mongering. And they're like, whoa, whoa, these Mexicans and the Moroccans, they have a reason to be angry because they are treated like shit in the media. They are being discriminated on a, on a, on a, on a systematic scale for the last 50 years. The story, the, I mean, when I go out and do readings, people want to hear these bad stories because they, they feel that, that they, in a way they feel like what's happening now in this world can only be resolved through this dialogue. I have two questions then, because you, you say that we have to take the, the debate on migration back from populists, right? How are we going to do this? And so maybe anger is a way, so maybe the stories have always been focused too much on positive things, on politeness, on hope, on... Um, is that, is, that, is that what you think? Well, you, it's is not, it, and then, me, I, and uh, then is it not only yeah. anger, but is it maybe also because what really works for populists right. is fear? So let me just make one thing. My book isn't just an angry rant. I mean, it's not <laughs> just me sitting on a phone box. It's <laughs> evidence-based anger. I've got 50 pages of footnotes, lots of statistics. So if you want to know why I'm pissed, you can go to the back of the book <laughs> and follow the link to the specific study that I cite. Look, it ends in hope, my book. Um, uh, I say immigrants uh, are a good thing for everyone, and uh, I'll tell you one way in which we can claim our place in the new country. So it's, um, th again, that Anna Faribulis uh, 2016, when Trump got elected, I got a phone call from my brother-in-law, um, who lives in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, a state in the Deep South. Um, he is Indian-American, and my sister um, moved from New York to Raleigh to marry him. Uh, he was working as a lawyer uh, for the state treasurer. And he called me up and said, okay, do I want to run for state senate? I said, in North Carolina, in the deep south? How are you going to support my sister? <laughs> and he said, no, no, I, um, I, I think I, I've got a shot. I said, look, your opponent, I looked up the district, it's a district that's 90% white. His opponent was a southern man with the fine old southern name of Ellis Hankins, <laughs> chair of the League of North Carolina Municipalities. I mean, he just <laughs> assumed the seat was his by divine right. So, um, so Jay starts running against Ellis Hankins, and he starts knocking on doors. Now, this is a district that's 90% white. He had to train his own campaign staff in how to pronounce his last name, <laughs> Chowdhury. Vote for Jay Chowdhury? No, Chowdhury. And he started knocking on doors, mm -hmm. and he knocked on 10,000 doors. Mm -hmm. I, my sons and I went down and knocked on doors. I knocked on doors. Uh, my younger son had a gun pulled on him. Get out of my yard. I had a dog set on me, although it was a small dog. Uh. <laughs> Still a dog. It was a poodle named Chewy. <laughs> <laughs> Chewy, you get back here, Chewy. Um, but he knocked on all these doors, and he talked to them about what was important to these voters. He said, look, the Republicans have devastated school funding, mm -hmm. and uh, our teacher uh, salaries are the fourth lowest in the country. Mm -hmm. We need to do something about public schools. There was something that everyone could identify with. They didn't care that he was small and brown and Bengali and they couldn't pronounce his last name. Jay, it was his first ever run for office, and he won in a landslide. He's sitting in the state senate of North Carolina right now, first Indian American state senator in North Carolina history, and furthermore, he's now the Democratic whip in the state senate. So it taught me a lesson. 
all politics is local, all politics is personal. So when we migrants go to these countries, mm -hmm. we have to claim our place in the politics and the public spaces of this country. You know, too often my people, Indian Americans, we go places and we're doctors and engineers, but we don't participate actively in public life. Mm -hmm. And now we're doing this, the next generation is doing this, and this is how we build a better future for all of us in these countries. It, and then you even say, so you don't need fear-mongering, you know, to convince people to vote for you. Well, it's a question of narrative, right? So, and we're storytellers. We know what narrative does. Um, the conversation around migration is about the populists, like this joker Trump and uh, this joker in my country, uh, Modi, who right now, as we speak, are hugging each other in this bromance. Uh, I just wrote a column in Time magazine today, if anyone's interested about the Trump-Modi bromance. Um, uh, and Trump uh, rails against Mexicans as Modi rails against Bangladeshis. But, you know, mm -hmm. basically it's a contest of storytelling. And too often people on our side, on the left, or academics, we resort to numbers, right? And mm -hmm. I've got plenty of numbers in my book because what we believe is that the only way to fight uh, a false story well told or entertainingly told is by a true story better told. But the true story also has to have stories. You know, it can't just be... The numbers, the numbers are on our side, indisputably, about uh, more immigration lifts everyone's fortunes. Mm -hmm. But in the end, stories are what reach the heart. I mean, think of the, you know, the religious scriptures of all uh, peoples. The Bible doesn't say, in a recent poll, 75% uh, <laughs> of people thought it, you should be nice to your neighbor because you're nice, <laughs> then your neighbor will be nice to you. Um, you know, Jesus spoke in parables, so does Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump is a reality star, and he doesn't care about numbers or the truth. He goes up, gets up and says, I met a guy in Paris once who told me that there are all these no-go zones where only Muslims mm -hmm. live, and the cops can't go in there. Yeah, I know this, this guy, Jim. Mm -hmm. And people believe him. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so we've got to respond with equally compelling stories, but backed up by the truth, right. by but numbers. But then there was this guy with a very good story. His name was Barack Obama. And how would you explain the backlash of Barack Obama when we say storytelling is so important? Because if someone was a good storyteller, I think uh, it was uh, Obama. Can you explain? Well, he did win eight years uh, in power as president <laughs> of the United States. Sort of <laughs> stories clearly yeah. did something, the first black president. And then in the US, you know, I mean, I've been there since 77. Obama gets elected, and we think, great, history is over. We've finally <laughs> elected a black president. We can all sit back and sip our lattes. Not so <laughs> fast. All the racists who'd been under uh, the rocks all those years came slithering out as soon as Trump got elected. Mm -hmm. um, and Obama himself wasn't great on immigration. He was called the deporter in chief because he's deported more people mm -hmm. uh, in his eight years than Trump has. Um, uh, in his administration so mm. far. Mm. Um, so what happened was there was a backlash and there was, let's face it, a white backlash. A lot of it was about racism. Yeah. People didn't like having a black president. And there was a race fear in America uh, about the number 2044, which is when America becomes a majority minority nation. That is, whites will be in the minority. But what is the, you know, I've always been struck by this concept of whiteness, of race. Is Obama half white or half black? You know, but uh, the fastest growing demographic group in the United States are people who identify themselves as multiracial, that is, uh, belonging to two or more races. So all over the world, you know, young people give me hope because there's a giant choosing, this incredible intermarriage, which really is the way of, of the future. Mm -hmm. People are choosing to marry other races, same gender, different gender, uh, same sex, choosing not to get married. There's a giant choosing, a giant collective overthrowing of taboos. Uh, and this too gives me hope. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, like in Holland, you know, the places where people overwhelmingly vote for anti-immigrant parties are in places where there are no um, immigrants. Yeah. You know, Wilders is big in Helmond. I mean, yeah. You are not big in Helmond. No, I you? was right in residence in Helmond. <laughs> really? And for most people, I was the first Moroccan they ever saw. Yeah. But he, w he won like a landslide in Helmond. And when you go out, 
we look at exit polls, you know, where, where the uh, Forum for Democracy wins, all in areas that, and, and, and predominantly also like in the big cities, the, the areas where you have a, a low class, left, felt left behind population, mm -hmm. whites. Um, but but I, I'm, I'm inspired by the story of your uh, brother-in-law because um, it touches me because for me as a writer, a storyteller, it's, you, create com you have to always have to create common ground. And especially in, in Holland, we tend to shed away from, you know, we have our busy life, we do our own things. But if you really want to convince someone, you have to start a dialogue with him. Mm -hmm. Which means you have to be a little bit courageous because not, not everyone is a talker, not everyone is, has this energy to knock on the door. A lot of Moroccans fear dogs, just like you say, Kutu. <laughs> but, but I tell young people with an immigrant background, don't buy the hate, you know, don't buy the hate slogans. Don't let what the populists are saying you turn away from communicating with people on a, on a grassroots level, you know, your neighbors, your, your people you meet at work. You ha always have to go back to start at the basic human principle of we're all, you know, we are in the end humans with our strength and our weaknesses. And, and, and really we're in a shitty period because there's so much hate speech going on. There are, so many, there are so many misconceptions about immigrants, and this gets this sticks to people. <laughs> and the only way to to counter this to, to, is really to go in in enemy you know enemy territory, you know, to go with it. and it, it it. But thank God we have places in Amsterdam where people meet, like the Avastraat in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. which for me was a, was a predominantly Moroccan, Turkish uh, shopping street multiculture. But now the last four or five years. Since the refugee crisis of the uh, Middle East, all kind of restaurants and supermarkets are popping up, run by Syrian people. Mm. And, and I think those people are doing more for, for acceptance, <laughs> doing more for letting people know their culture, than one 10, million, 10 billion tw uh, Twitter tweets about that culture. Because people, in the end, want to smell you. They want to eat your food. They want to share your food. They want to feel welcome. And they want to also have the feeling that they can contribute to your destiny. And so these, for me, these people in the Africa, they lead by example, just by doing. And they have to, we all have to do this because our future is bleak. It's not good. The life is getting more expensive. Schooling is under pressure. Our, 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 uh, um, what is it called? our hospitals, you know, are, are, being, are not getting, so there are a lot of problems that, 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 that touch everyone in society. Mm -hmm. And the only one to, to deal with is to, to, to do this together and to go beyond the ethnic divide because, because but, that, but, that, uh, that, that will you, not help but us. But when you were in Helmond, yes. um, so did you talk? Yeah, yeah, that? I talked. What, I talked, what, what yeah. happened? Did you get through the, the uh, bubble? People, no, yeah, easily. I was, I was invited to, you know, the, the most prestigious thing you can do in Helmond mm -hmm. is be guest of honor at the carnival. Yeah. You know, like, 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 that's like, and they, they, they test you. You know this. They test you. These people. They say, oh, this is a Moroccan guy. And they had a problem with me because even they had the right wing party in the in the municipality yeah. that objected to my right in residency. You know why? <laughs> Not because he's a Moroccan, because he's from Amsterdam. Oh yeah. Why do we have someone from Amsterdam coming? To, you know. You know. And 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 I and I and I thought, oh wow, this is cool. It's good. It's becoming politicized. So it gives me the opportunity mm -hmm. to prove that mm -hmm. what I'm going to do is for all the people, not just for you know. And I came, and after a year, I was invited by the, you know, Carnival's a big thing there, and they have this, this local club that comes together every year. It's like, like kind of academia. And, and I was invited, I was sitting, and, and, then they, and they test you by talking. The first hour, they talk to me in their, in their local patois, you know, the Helmonts, which I do not understand. But, but, and then they test you. They see how you react. And the moment they see that you're open, that you're not afraid of them, that you do not come in with prejudices. Because they would say, what do you think of us? Mm -hmm. You think that we are as stupid as they say? Mm -hmm. Because these people, they feel in a way, you're an intruder, you're an outsider who comes with his elitist idea about their carnival, about their culture. And, and, I, and I was like, oh, I know this. They behave like Moroccans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is cool, easy. <laughs> you know, they party like Moroccans. <laughs> they, they have the same fear like Moroccans. And I'm just here to prove that I'm on their side, just by being myself. 
And it was great, because, because at the end of the evening, they would pronounce my name you know, perfectly. You know, I say, we have now a special guest from Amsterdam, but originally he's from Morocco, which is even Luckily, better. Yeah. And, then, so, and I think you really, and, but it's scary. It is scary, because when you enter a room like that, and all those big Dutch people, you know, like two meter ten, you know, and they, and they wear strange costumes, they look at you. Of course you feel intimate. You, it's intimidating. You know, you have to read the room at this woman medicine from a new... But I felt like, okay, this is a place where I can break the narrative. Yeah. Where just being is a narrative in itself that can change the discourse. Yeah. And, it's, and, 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 and uh, so that's something I, I, yeah. I take with me. Yeah, thank you. I thought, uh, I hope you're okay with this, Sarah, but before we go to the quiz, maybe there are two or three questions of the audience right now to do things that I've missed. Um, so if you have a question about what we've just been discussing, please raise your hand. And then there's, oh yeah, of course, really in the corner. <laughs> do you have a mic, Sarah? Yeah. Yes, it's um, over there to the left. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, uh, for both gentlemen, I mean, you talk a whole positive story about immigration. Um, don't you believe that there are also certain problems with migration? Also looking in this country, we do have certain problems that needs to be solved. And I'm not talking about the both dads of this father of the builders, they're talking about bullshit. But if you look at the facts, there are certain problems. And even the immigra uh, immigrant uh, 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 people, they also accept this, they also know this. That needs to be solved. And my question is, don't you see this? Well, you know, that's the elephant in the room. Thank you for addressing it. <laughs> it's true. I mean, we have, we have all kinds of consequences that come out of migration that are not, uh, that, don't do, that do not, you know, that, 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 that create criminality. Well, you can name them. But I think that the populist agenda is not going to solve it. It's going to make it only worse by putting people against each other, by making criminality at, uh, uh, linked to ethnicity, to making uh, fundamentalism linked to religion, and to make it like, like almost as a, as a citizen in, in Holland with a Muslim background or whatever, you have to, f you are like, eth eth like in your DNA already predisposed to evil, you're not go going to solve these problems. We all know why. Because we're talking about individuals. We're talking about people. And, 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 and so I would, l so what I'm trying to do now is, of course, I address this too, also in my own community, but I have to bring in humanity to the, to, 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 to the discourse about migration. Because it's, what, what is not lacking is, is, is hysteria, but what is totally lacking is humanity. We, we just get, we get upset, we got totally hysterical, and we start talking in, in all kinds of prejudices. And these prejudices, they have been taken as a truth now, they have become dogma. Even the, my, my fear is that right-wing parties, my fear is that, main, that, is that mainstream parties took over the, the dogmas of the right-wing parties. And this is what's happening on a big scale. It led to Brexit, it led to you know, Trump, etc., etc., etc. I mean, that's the biggest problem. And the only way to counter this peacefully is to be very, very strong about the humanity of all people as a nation. And also tell people that there is no national answer to universal phenomenon. We, the, the, the whole idea of border, it, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's outdated. Uh, I, I'd like to respond to that. So uh, these problems, you know, I'm assuming you're talking, among other things, about crime. In the US, at least, um, immigrants commit crimes at far lower rates than the native born. And again, my book has lots of evidence about this. Um, and what I also write is that the fear of migrants is causing incalculably more damage to these countries than the migrants themselves ever could. In Exhibit A, as you said, is Brexit, the biggest own goal in British history, uh, caused principally by fear of migrants. In country after country, people out of the fear of migrants are electing these populists who are doing tremendous long-term damage to these countries. But there are intelligent ways, I agree that um, there are certain short-term effects of immigration, such as um, unskilled labor, 
when uh, if there's a large amount of unskilled labor that comes in into a country all at once, then those jobs, for example, of high school dropouts are affected. But there are ways that the government can um, redistribute the income, the extra income that comes from extra migration. So, for example, in the US, Silicon Valley, you know, all the Google, Microsoft, etc., are pushing Congress for more immigration into the country, particularly skilled immigration. But as unskilled migrants come in, for example, gardeners or uh, agricultural workers or nannies, um, the native-born gardeners and nannies, people who dropped out of high school, in the short term, there is some economic evidence to show that they're adversely affected. Well, an intelligent response to this would be for a tax or levy on the Silicon Valley companies that want to let in more migrants and take that income and redistribute it to these communities, these people, re-educate them so that they don't have to stay being gardeners and nannies, that they can get jobs higher up the socioeconomic ladder. The same thing with communities along the border whose hospitals and schools might be overwhelmed by waves of migration. There could be some redistribution of this kind of income. Um, you know, these are intelligent responses to immigration, but in the debate around migration, there's a lot of heat and very little light. And the whole world, it's not just a national policy, the world has to come together in some sort of global response to migration. Because climate change and mass migration caused by climate change is going to be the defining phenomenon of the 21st century. The only collective response we've had so far has been um, uh, the UN Compact on Migration. And there, many countries, including the US, have just completely walked out of this compact. Mm -hmm. We have to come together as a species to figure out what to do about these waves of people who are going to be, you know, all these small island nations are going to be underwater by the end of the century. The uh, Prime Minister of Mauritius uh, held a whole cabinet meeting completely underwater to show the rest of the world what was going to happen to his country. Um, so yeah, there are intelligent ways of, of uh, dealing with migration. Um, yes, then we only do, <laughs> oh, now you come all, yeah. Uh, it has, the answers has to be a bit shorter, otherwise we cannot uh, do the rest anymore. Uh, two, two questions here. Yeah, my, my name is uh, Ahmed Abdillahi. I'm uh, from Rotterdam, and last Saturday I, I read in Dutch a quality paper, an uh, interview of Mr. Uh, Sekutu Mehta, and because of this uh, interview, uh, I came tonight to, uh, to Amsterdam, and the reason why I came was because something in the interview really touched me. Uh, the, sto the stories you was telling about the woman from Cameroon, uh, Geralda, uh, it really uh, touched me because I know similar cases. I have a, a sister who is living in in UK. She's living in there for almost 11 years now. Uh, 11 years ago, she, she left a lot of uh, her children in, in Somalia, so she didn't see them for almost 11 years. Uh, uh, all of the children, they grow up now, most of them, they have uh, WhatsApp uh, accounts. Through that, they chat with each other. And once she told me, I would uh, everything in the world uh, trade for to see my uh, children and again. And a lot of my family members, some of them, they live in India, some of them, they live in, in Indonesia. So when I was reading that story about Geralda was really touching me because I know a lot of people who live the same life. And uh, my question of you is, um, how can we deal with that and try to help also people who didn't, because it's a basic human rights, someone who didn't see her children for almost 11 years. And nowadays, to go from UK to Africa, it's a few hours flight to there, maybe thousand, thousand, or few thousand dollars. So how can we help help people with similar cases? Absolutely. Thank be, you. Be, so before much. you answer, uh, <laughs> I, I want to say something. 
uh, that uh, this this wonderful man came from Rotterdam to mm. Amsterdam mm. to see you because of the interview. It's a big thing. Yes. It's a big thing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yes, um, I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of your question um, and that you came all this way to see me. No, you're absolutely right. What you said, your sister not seeing her children for 11 years. I met so many people like this. You, all of you know people like this. You know, it, it just ask people in the shops, people who are cleaning your houses, people who are selling you things, uh, the sacrifices that they make. And it's an atrocity. It makes my blood boil. It brings tears to my eyes and makes my blood boil when I see these mothers taking care of other people's children so that their own children might live a decent life in the countries that they've left behind. There ought to be a sanctuary spot somewhere on earth a global friendship park where your sister can meet her children and give them a hug and meet them for half an hour, have a meal with them so that she's not just a figure on a WhatsApp screen. You know, there, there should be a, the, the UN should do something about this. All over the world we're seeing this. You know, I had a babysitter in New York, uh, she was Indian, uh, she hadn't seen her children for 10 years. She was taking care of my own. Um, and she was doing it because she needed to send money back to her family in a, a village. And I remember once someone showed her a picture album and there was a wedding. And she l points to a picture of a girl uh, in the wedding and she says, oh, who's that? And the woman who's showing her the picture looks at her strangely and says, that's your daughter. It was the time before Skype, and my babysitter burst into tears. Um, it's, it's, it's an unremarked tragedy. Uh, it hasn't been written about enough, mm. uh, and it, it, no civilized country should tolerate this. I, I have to can, end it here. Can, I, can you say something <laughs> about visa regulations? Uh, uh, the, because he, he touched on a very important topic. I give you uh, what, give one me, minute. Give me, give me 20 minutes. He said, <laughs> wh why can we go, passport, we go to Schiphol, and yeah. to, to five hours we're in Bamako, and mm. people in Bamako cannot come. To what, the, what we in the West, we don't know, and I, and I know about it because I go to Morocco, is to get a visa for the West is the most humiliating mm. thing in the world. It's, it takes years. It takes a lot of money, and it's humiliating because the, the, the embassy is bringing you down. It's turning you into a number. You can be as highly educated, but it, it brings you down. It's humiliating, and you have to. So people put a lot of em, emotional, they invest their emotion, their life, their money in getting a visa for the West. Now we know why they don't go back. If you put so much money, emotional time, emotional time. I swear I will get it. You bribe people, and you get your visa. Well, you will never go back yeah. because it's too expensive. Yeah, valid point. Okay, we're now going um, to the migration quiz, and this is also really to see what I said. How biased? I mean, because I think we're kind of in Dutch we say preken voor eigen parochie. Uh, I mean, this audience, we're, I think we're really on the same side, but. I think we also have to, say, have to be very aware of the, oh, the, the biases we uh, have ourselves. So I would like to give the floor to Esh, sorry, Eshkan Farjania. I probably pronounced it horribly. I'm very sorry. Uh, you are a visual and performance artist, and most of your work is about redefining the role of art as a catalyst for change, as, especially in asylum and migration cases. And your most recent work, Refugee on Trial, examined the Dutch asylum system by reenacting a real court case against an Afghan Afghani asylum system. Um, you're gonna, now going to do something different. Uh, please walk us through it. Thank you. Eshan. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, there mm. is a, a quiz, so we're going to do a quiz, yes? Yeah. So, but for the quiz, you're going to answer the questions, right? Yeah, th you didn't know this, huh? You didn't? Mm. Okay, well. You can talk to me, you know, don't be so shy. Mm. Um, um, so, you're going to answer the questions, and you're going to do that with your phone, with your mm. 
smartphones, if you have a smartphone. Um, so so all please right. bring your phones out. Yeah, and if, if your telephone is almost dying, we have some power banks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this is fun, yeah? Uh, I, need, I need this chair. Is it possible to take this chair? Because I'm sure for some of the questions, you're going to take a long time, so I need to sit down probably. <laughs> all right. Are you almost ready? Do you have internet on you? No. Oh, no. my God. Um, Oh yeah, you are seeing the URL, yes. This is the URL and you probably received it at the entrance with this small um, handout. Um, those are also possible. Uh, how are you doing? I see most of you looking at their telephone. Please raise your hand if you're on the good website. Is that a good idea so we know that people are yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. almost getting there, right? <laughs> yeah, I think 80% of us are already there. And the rest is coming as well. So I need to tell you a few things, but I just take a little bit more time till you are there, yeah? <clears throat> Everyone there? Yeah? All right, so then some of the answers might be a bit general, so I want you to select the most specific answer, yes? Um, and then you can also change your vote, but don't do it too much because then you take the vote of the other people. There is certain amount of vote that could be given, so don't change your vote. And then it asks you for choosing a name, and choose a name that you could Recognize, don't be like, if everybody is anonymous, then we don't know who is who, yeah? So just take a name like E12, uh, Z55, something like this. Um, yes, and each question has a count of, so you need, you need to be sharp and smart and fast and everything. So the speed counts as well. So the, the faster you answer, the more points you get. <laughs> um, yeah, and then if you, each two up to about like thousand points you can get for each uh, correct answer. Are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And w what? What? Um, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna say too many things. I'm not gonna <laughs> what? Exactly, exactly. Nothing. So, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Question number one. I, as a Dutch person, want to go to Belgium to stay forever. What am I? The next slide, please. Am I a migrant? Am I an immigrant from Netherlands? Am I immigrating to Belgium? Am I an expat? Oh, it says it's locked? Yeah, yeah, there's something uh, with the timer uh, that it does that. Um, uh, God, could we go back to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the IND. There could be the IND, <laughs> you know, the, the Dutch immigration office. Uh, Mrs. IND, could we... No, the time. What is it with the timer? <laughs> it's working now? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, so answer, answer. <laughs> Did you answer? Okay, can we go to the next slide, IND? Okay, so 19% um, of you answered the correct answer, which is emigrant from Netherlands I will be. So most of you thought immigrating to Belgium. Excuse me, what? <laughs> no, I'm interested, what did it? That was Siri. What did Siri say? It's usually interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can, Siri cannot answer that question right now. Okay, okay. Yes. Yes. That could be. Yeah, you are very accurate. Can we have a round of applause for this? Sir? <laughs> that's that's really so sharp and to the point. Thank you. Um, are we ready? F 
<laughs> Thanks. Uh, can we have the next <laughs> slide, please? Okay, so we can see who is winning. Okay, <laughs> all these people are winning right now. <laughs> okay, so can we go to the next question, please? <laughs> Am I a Dutch person? Next slide, please. Yes, Iranian, Turkish, Spanish, no Moroccan. <laughs> Uh, did you answer? Yes. There's something. What is with the timer? Can we can we go back and come forward again? I'm sorry for this technical error. IND. Yes. Go go now. And is it open now? Okay. And did you answer? Am I a Dutch person? Yes. No. Okay. Uh, next. <laughs> yes. Seventy percent said yes. And only 11% said no. <laughs> yes. So, especially for those who said no, the next question is for you. Can we go to the, yes, the ladder. Look at that. Oh, go back, go back, go back, go back. It's interesting. I want to see who's winning. Okay, Mr. Sophie is uh, followed <laughs> by William and guest uh, 844, and Lena is after them. All right, excellent. So for those who said no, watch out. <laughs> um, next question. Do you want to see my passport? Do you want to see my passport, yes or no? Uh, I'm this is a very simple question, so maybe... <laughs> Maybe we can go already to the next one. IND, please. I wish IND was always listening to me like this. It must be so great. Uh, passport? No. They don't want to see my passport. <laughs> I feel a bit uh, strange now. Why not? Why you don't want to see my passport? Who, who doesn't want to see my passport? Why not? I mean, it's a beautiful passport. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, finally, I got a passport and no one wants to see it. <laughs> All right. Sophie is still number one, followed by William, followed by guest 488. Daniel is coming up. Whoa, Daniel. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Do I have a job in Netherlands? Yes, the lock is coming up. <coughs> yes, all right. Yes, everybody thinks it's yes. Who's, who said yes? Wait, 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 where are you going? IND, please, don't go too fast. I need to discuss this really important stuff. Um, so, wait, wait a second. So, do you guys think I have a job? Are you volunteering tonight? Excuse me? Are you volunteering tonight? Yes. You have a job, right? Yes, but having a job means like, you know, having a proper job that you go everywhere. Oh my God, you guys are so difficult. Okay. So, 6% said no. All right, let's go to the next one. Excuse me, what? What is the question? I don't have a job. Yeah, just very simple, I don't have a job. Um, next question, please. I have no work in Netherlands. That's uh, why I must go to Belgium. So I have no work here. I need to go to Belgium. What am I? Can we see the answers? <laughs> Emigrant, expat, guest worker, fortune seeker. And the time is up already. Was it too fast? Yeah, yeah you need more time? IND, could you please? Uh, yeah? Is it up now? Hello, sir. You want to join me here? <laughs> Bye. <laughs> to Maastricht. <laughs> to Maastricht. Okay, have a good travel. Do you guys have time, enough time to answer now? All right, okay. So, 
What is the correct answer? Fortune seeker, only 20% of you said the correct answer. So what did you thought? Like the most percent I thought, I'm expat. Uh, thank you, I feel, uh, I feel honored here already. Okay, can we see the winners? MNN is uh, winning now. And Carol is uh, following, and Abdul Ghadir is number three. Wow, okay, Abdul Ghadir is coming up. Watch out, guys. Okay, so as you might know, a fortune seeker is not allowed in Belgium, especially without a password, and even if it's Dutch like me. So the situation is like this now. Could we have the next question, please? Because of Dutch war with Friesland, excuse me, no, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> IND, please. Could we have the question? Excuse me? Oh, otherwise the ti timer would be something. But still, I need to read the question. How are they going to answer? All right, so what? I'm, I'm not a presenter here. I, I'm getting paid to do something here. <laughs> Jesus. Okay, th so answer then. Come on, answer. It's locked, yeah, it's your problem. I told you. I told you not to do this. IND, do you see what you do with people? Go back to your own country. <laughs> okay, I think I'm becoming a comedian. This is too much. Uh, okay. So, the question is, there is a war yeah, between Netherlands and Friesland, and the EU member of the Netherlands is revoked. I, as a Friesian, flee to Belgium. What am I? Like, well, go to the answers now. Yes, so you, you have time now to answer? Okay, you see, everything is fine. Yes? Can we total result 2363? Okay. I will be an illegal immigrant. That's correct. Yes. Yes, echt? Yeah. Why? I will not easily be granted a refugee status in Belgium because war is only in Friesland. Perhaps I could go to Rotterdam, and there I will be safe. There's no war in Rotterdam. What do you think? Bullshit, yeah. bullshit? yeah, I hear bullshit. I hear something else. What? I love Rotterdam. You love Rotterdam, okay. So maybe I should go to Rotterdam. Yeah. Well, who's, who decide this answer? You, none of you ask, like, who says this is the correct answer? Excuse me? You said European law. I am in? European law. European law, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not in European law. I worked with a lawyer who said these are the correct answers. So almost the IND. Uh, okay, so... So I cannot go to Belgium, that's the, that's, the, that's the part, yeah? So let's go to the next one. I, as the Frisian separatist, uh, go to Belgium embassy in Den Haag. I ask for protection by testifying. My life is in danger in the whole country of Netherlands. Even Rotterdam isn't safe anymore. Here, I could immediately become can we go to the answers? Is there locked again? Yeah. Could you re refresh again? Maybe it opens? Is it open? Okay. I could become... So you understand the situation. It's a very critical situation, no? So I could become a political refugee, asylum seeker, diplomatic refugee, temporary refugee, illegal refugee, internally displaced person. 
Can we see the correct answer? Oh, all of you thought I will be a political refugee. Mm. No, no, no. I could be a diplomatic refugee, right? For example, Julian Assange went to the uh, Ecuadorian embassy and immediately he got a diplomatic refugee status. Yes? Can we see the winners? Uh, Lawrence, the new upcoming Lawrence, uh, followed by Temo, followed by Jantas, and MNN. Beautiful. Where, where are the rest of the people? <laughs> like this ladder is only just, uh, okay. Um, okay, next question please. I as a Frisian separatist say, my life is in danger in Netherlands because I refuse the military service. Please take me to your beautiful country. Then, in this situation, I could become... Can we see the answers? Is it locked again? It's open. Locked? Locked, can we... Yeah, do the thing, yeah. Open? Okay. So, in that situation, do you understand? This is a very critical situation. I could become either a refugee, de facto refugee, de jure refugee, not a refugee. I see some people scratching their head. What is de facto refugee? What is de jure refugee? De facto refugee is when I haven't received positive status. Haven't received positive status. De jure refugee is when I have been recognized as a refugee, but I haven't received the passport. Yeah? Yes, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, all right. Well, let's see the answer. Not a refugee, not a refugee. Only 33% of you guessed. Well, actually, most of you guessed it. How, do, how, how who, who guessed right? Can you, can you tell me how do you know? Yeah, well, how do you know? Uh, madam, there, how do you know? Yeah. Just, just the luck, good, good luck. You got a, you got an idea. Right. Well, I mean, it sounds a bit strange because if I break the law and I go to another country, so if I'm like, in some countries you cannot be a political opposition, right? Well, let's not discuss it too much, actually. Uh, it's true, if you are, if you, but the, the, the thing is like, if you are uh, escaping military service, you cannot become a refugee. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't make this, this rules. <laughs> I don't know. Um, all right. Shall we go to the next question? So you see my situation, yeah? Okay, yeah, let's see. Temo. Temo is up with 500, uh, uh, and then Mar is, is followed by Marcus, and Abdul Ghadir is coming. Abdul Ghadir is coming up again, followed by Bob and Lawrence and Sobhi and William, and Jantas, and Raul, and Mr. Peterson. <laughs> Thank you. Can we go to question number nine? So, my life is in danger because of climate change in Netherlands. Please let me go to Belgium. This is what I say in the embassy, yeah? I'm still in the embassy, trying things out. What are they saying in the embassy? Can we go to the answers? What could I become with the climate? Could I become a refugee, climate change refugee, environmental migrant, not a refugee? Is, is the pool open or closed? Open? Open, open. Like uh, borders of Belgium. Yes? Are you there now? Yes? So, let's see the right answer. Not a refugee. Not a refugee. No, I'm sorry, you're not a refugee because escaping climate change doesn't grant you 
a refugee status either. So escaping military, forget it. Um, climate change, forget it. Except that United Nations Committee has um, judged the tipping point verdict on the cases of a family from Pacific nation of Kiribati. Any idea where it is? Kiribati is, uh, you know, on top of New Zealand there. This family applied for the refugee st status in New Zealand in 2013. They claimed that their lives were at risk due to the shrinking size of the island and lack of clean water. New Zealand rejected their case, but the United Nations Committee responded with non-refoulement decree. That means that New Zealand cannot send them back. All right? So, let's see who's winning. Abdul Khader is coming up. Uh, at the same level with Bob and Lawrence. Bob is a newcomer, hey, eh? Bob. All right, all right. So, next slide, please. After two rejections, I crossed the border by walking at night to Belgium. Then, as a true Frisian separatist, I act against the Dutch government. How do I do that? I, uh, oh my God. All right, let's carry on like this, yeah? So, as a true separationist, I um, organize demonstration in Belgium. I, um, I distribute propaganda. And I say, uh, <laughs> um, and that's why I cannot go back to Netherlands, because I acted against the Netherlands. Um, so now I cannot return to this country. What am I now? Can we see the next slide? Am I uh, stateless? Am I illegal immigrant? Am I political refugee? Am I a refugee uh, surplus? Am I de facto refugee? Am I de jour refugee? Can you vote? The pool is open? Yes. Yeah? It's, uh, if you guys answer this one correctly, I'll be really surprised. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So, so can we see the correct answer, please? <laughs> Only 6% of you, you see? Everybody thinks I'm an illegal immigrant. Yeah, of course. But I'm not. I will be a refugee surplus, which is quite sexy. It's for, for the refugees who are coming to another country and act against their government and therefore cannot be sent back, they could receive the refugee surplus. If you have refugee friends, give them this information. Um, Okay, so shall we see um, the results? Yes, Lawrence is the true winner. Who is that? Exactly, who is that? Are you? Really? Wow, amazing, amazing. Thank you, Lawrence, thank you. So, are you guys tired? Really tired, huh? Because I have a few more questions, but we can go maybe fast. We have to go on? We only have 10 minutes and I'm going Really? Okay. So let's stop it. It was about my beard. and uh, But okay. Well, next time then. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ashan, can you take the chair and join us for the last uh, two to 10 minutes? I don't know what to do with this. Just to keep it with you. I'll take the handheld. Um, because I was, uh, we really, I really stop at 10 minutes, so don't worry. Um, because I was curious, because I thought we were going to examine our own biases, but this was more our knowledge about the whole uh, judicial system on asylum seekers. So I thought, what, what, what would you like to really point out? It, it wasn't what I thought, so... Uh, a little bit about what you mentioned, but the mm -hmm. first part is, yeah, usually about like to understand what is our knowledge of this 
technocratic system, right? Mm -hmm. well, like, how much do we actually know? Because there is so many, we, we tend to just like push everyone on the same side, but how much do we know actually about all these different terms? And also, like being biased is also sometimes about categorizing people. Yeah. So it's also about like how many categories do we have actually created and why? How have you listened to the debate so far? I mean, yeah. we've been talking about... Uh, uh, how immigrants used to be, how immigrants are changing. Oh, you get a new mic. Um, do you think it was legitimate to talk about the immigrants as, you know, as groups? Or did you want to point out that you cannot talk about them as, uh, you know? Well, I mean, in the end we have to choose certain words, you know, so that's how we communicate. So, mm. Mm. Yeah, but uh, but at the same time, um, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer this question. Uh, what what do I think about immig immigrants? Mm -hmm. Is that your question? No. Can you can we talk in this uh, large? Do, do you guys know this this this? Uh, do you guys know this? Uh, yeah, most of you know it. The you mean Fight the poster? Out. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, did you guys know that person? What it was the the, the French guy who who well he he became French immediately afterwards. So that's again it shows the the racist migration uh, system that policies. that we uh, policies that yeah. we have right. Uh, because yeah exactly if they are crossing the borders, mm -hmm. they are not welcome. But if they have a really good skill, then immediately mm -hmm. they can get their refugee status. And do you believe in this power of discourse we have discussed in this kind of, you, you know, person-to-person -person contact, you know, to create a counter-human narrative? Um, yes, of course. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, Netherlands is a country of uh, discuss discussion and conversations and uh, <laughs> um, sometimes I'm a bit, a bit uh, thinking like, okay, could be also a bit different, uh, but but I like but I like and I appreciate uh, also a bit more clashing opinions. Uh, yeah. You want to clash? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, can I agree with you about something? We can discuss the clashing. <laughs> uh, the the taxonomy of migration was really. I'm so glad you drew attention to that. I remember when I. Um, you know, the, all these Americans that came to Europe, Hemingway and Gertrude Stein and all these people, they got to call themselves expat writers. They were the lost generation. Um, Western executives, when they go abroad and live, you know, in India or Morocco, they get to be called expats. Yeah. But if Moroccans and Indians move, then we're immigrants or refugees. So the label that you have at the border, whether you call yourself a refugee, a migrant, an expat, or a tourist, like <laughs> this gentleman's sister can, uh, can't meet her children, but if she had a Western passport, then she could fly back and forth all she wanted. So in the 21st century, your humanity is defined by your passport, by your nationality, and also, that is an atrocity. Also, I think maybe a little bit by your outfit, because most of you guys thought I was an expat, and I would have a job. So again, coming back to the uh, mm -hmm. to the bias that we have inside ourselves, mm -hmm. that's why I was also playing with my outfit, uh, putting a suit on, taking a suit out, and you probably think I'm play I'm presenting in the Bali, so I have a good mm -hmm. job, uh, you know. Uh, well, we thought this was your job, a very interesting job. Uh, well, yeah. The question is if it's pay enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you can call it a job or not. Yeah. Thank you. I am. Um, I had this last question because there was all this uh, talk about the, the anger, the power of anger. And then my last question was, uh, where is the hope? Um, you already told us you were hopeful, but maybe can you give to close, because you're really good at giving like these personal story examples, like an, a story that makes you really hopeful. Look, just a little earlier, you, who are part... Um, Indonesian, and then you have a Jewish heritage, Abdel, who's Moroccan and Dutch, Zara here, who is, is uh, Kurdish, uh, I'm Indian-American, 
The four of us walked into a bar. It sounds like the beginning of a joke. But no, <laughs> it's the reality of Amsterdam today. Yeah. It's the reality of New York today. The great cities of our world thrive on this kind of wonderful cohabitation. I mean, we are in, our lives are enriched that I don't just have to eat dal chawal at home. I've got a choice of pizza and Dutch pancakes. The Dutch don't just have to eat pancakes. They can eat uh, the foods of the world. Um, we, can, we get this experience of people from all over the world, their music, their food, their culture, their stories, and the living, the great cities of the world, like Amsterdam, like New York, are testament that immigration works. Yes, there are clashes sometimes, there are ghettos, there are problems, but considering the problems that countries and cities have had, I mean, mm -hmm. wholesale massacres and civil wars, you know, these cities are flourishing, and they're mm -hmm. flourishing because of immigration. Yeah. In the end, immigration is a good news story. Yeah. Well, I'm very happy you made me part of your good news story. <laughs> and uh, I think we again came to the subject of food, so I think next program should be, uh, you know, um, a case for more food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, I really want to thank you, also Eshan, Abdelkader, and Suketu. And um, if you want to read more, read more beautiful stories, please buy the book. It's for sale, and we hope to talk more at the bar. Thank you very much for your attention.